All right, well, here we go. We'll just do this. Okay. So I think this is a really interesting time to be here because this issue of the power wielded by big business and big tech in particular is at the forefront of both society and business. And that convergence doesn't happen often. And there are a lot of threads to this from privacy to market power. The Washington Post just reported that federal investigators are um, investigating Facebook for mishandling its users' um, personal information. And my friend Rana Faruhar just wrote this, which I found really interesting. 80% of corporate wealth now resides in 10% of companies rich in intellectual property, of which the platform companies are the richest, according to the McKinsey Global Institute. It is a power that has grown so quickly and changed so much that it is forcing a fundamental rethink of everything from antitrust policy to the rules that have governed the internet for more than 20 years. So I'm very delighted to be here with Tim Wu, an author and Columbia Law professor whose latest book, which was published this fall by Columbia Global Reports, is called The Curse of Bigness, Antitrust in the New Gilded Age. And Tyler Cohen, The Economist, prolific author and George Mason professor, whose latest book is called Big Business, A Love Letter to an American Anti-Hero. Never have book titles alone made it so clear that there's going to be a debate. <laughs> so, I wanted to start by giving you guys an opportunity to talk a bit about your books. Tim, as a means of telling us about your book, books are pretty horrid things to produce, so you have to care deeply, right? So what made you write this book? Uh, that's a good question. So I. Um you know, I've spent a little time uh, attending conferences like this, uh, working in government and uh, teaching antitrust law. And I felt that what we needed uh, in this space was a book that returned to some of the older uh, traditions and origins of antitrust law to give a sense as to what the law was uh, originally and, and through its career ha had thought was important. I feel sometimes we are too obsessed with the debates of the 80s and 1990s, and I wanted to sort of give a broader perspective, you know, um, we sometimes get too focused on right now, the people in the 50s and, and 20s and 30s, you know, they were smart, pretty smart in their own ways and sometimes see things uh, in a deep way. And what, what I, I, I felt about this is that we, from this experience, is that we really have become too focused on uh, a, a narrow sense of antitrust, which is really focused on, on, on price effects uh, primarily. I mean, sometimes we say, oh, we can incorporate other stuff, but it's primarily focused on price effects. And we've forgotten the importance of protecting competition. We've forgotten some of the, the importance which antitrust attached to, to, to political, the political dangers of private power, uh, to the idea that it was an important remedy against the rise of, of, uh, of fascism, authoritarian government, the, the concerns that, that economic uh, dictatorship might lead to, to political dictatorship, that these were all things that people really cared about uh, for most of the career of the antitrust laws. So the way I see it, you know, our current uh, more consumer welfare, you know, is a recent, uh, uh, you know, sort of a recent um, experiment. And I wanted us to come from a perspective where, you know, all the options are on, on the table and uh, understand there's a, a much broader legacy. That was, that, so that was the point of the book. And, you know, I have ideas in the book for how we should re reboot antitrust. Uh, I think it's an important tradition. And I guess I'll come, I'll finish with this. I don't want to go on forever. But I think there's an important American tradition here which is critical and hostile to concentrated private power. Concentrated power in general, but also the sense of concentrated private power has its own dangers. Some of them are expressed uh, economically, but some of them are also political dangers. And I think that uh, you know, we've drifted too far from, from that vision. And uh, you know, Potofsky said this back in the 70s, uh, if you understand antitrust purely in its sort of microeconomic uh, side of things, you're really missing a lot of what this law is meant to be about. So we're going to come back to some of those issues, including the pricing issue. But Tyler, why a love letter at this moment in time? I am not worried about Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos controlling our government. Uh, my book as a whole covers big business, but let me jump right into the tech chapter. If you look at the large tech companies, uh, their size is not illegal. If we look at consumer harm, which really is the number one standard. If consumers are not being harmed, if consumers are benefiting from the current arrangement, there's at least a strong prima facie case for how things are now. In terms of significant consumer harm, I think there's been a remarkable amount of consumer surplus generated over the last 10 to 15 years by the major tech companies. A general point, when innovation is alive and well in a market, how well can regulators, antitrust authorities, whoever, either predict what will happen, what should happen, figure out how to steer that market? That's extremely difficult to do. I remember it was not many years ago. 
people in the know were insisting that perhaps Facebook had no way of making money and the company would disappear and blow away. So the gains from innovation are paramount here. Just to close my introduction with a simple example, well, sometimes you hear, well, Facebook doesn't face much competition. Well, let me just tell you some different ways I can do social networking. I can go on Snap. I can go on Fortnite. It's kind of a super gaming system. It's attracted tens of millions of users in but a few months. I can use email. I can text people on my cell phone. I can use Pinterest. I can use Twitter. What I do personally is I use my blog for social networking. Believe it or not, you can still blog. At times, I've knocked on the door of my neighbor. Uh, that didn't work out well, but it's there <laughs> for those of you who want it. And there are multiple other messaging services. You know, Slack is, is one of many, Apple. Gmail chat, which everyone says is terrible. I've talked over Gmail chat. I mean, it's not that bad. That is a market. When you want to connect with other people, there are many, many ways to do it. Yes, there's always a way to define the market narrowly or it looks like it's not very competitive. But the actual choices out there compared to 15, 20 years ago, my goodness, it's a stupendous increase in competition and diversity. We're going to come back to some of that as well, but I thought it would be fun to read you each a quote from the other's book and have you react. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Tyler, Tim writes this about big tech. If there is a sector more ripe for the reinvigoration of the big case tradition, I do not know it. And he put it at a different point in his book. Big tech is ubiquitous, seems to know too much about us, and seems to have too much power over what we see, do, and even feel. It's a lot of very general words in that passage. I would say let's focus on specifics. Let's find consumer harms when they are there and remedy them. There's a possibility, for instance, how Apple has run its app store has some consumer harm. In general, I'm sympathetic to the idea of improving privacy legislation. I also believe we haven't found a really good way to do it yet. GDPR, in my view, increases barriers to innovation. If anything, it will cement in the supposed monopoly powers that many of us here are worried about. So I would focus regulatory efforts where consumer harm is clear, not most of the big tech sector, and yes, let's try to get privacy better than we have it now, but let's not act hastily and simply cement in the incumbents. Tim, Tyler writes this. For the most part, to continue my love letter to American business, I would like to speak up for tech companies, especially the big ones. They have brought human beings into closer contact with each other than ever before, whether emotionally, intellectually, mostly through social media. They have placed so much of the world's information at our fingertips. Whatever problems these developments may have brought in their wake, they are unparalleled achievements and arguably the greatest advances of the contemporary world. So I'm a, a fan of uh, Voltaire, as I'm sure many of you are in this room, and uh, I read with a uh, great interest, both Tyler, uh, Tyler's book and, and Candide. And I would say that <laughs> at its worst, uh, your, your book uh, makes the uh, uh, assertion that we're living in the best of all possible worlds. And I, I think that we need, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is most, um, you know, and I think you have a certain caveat, you'd like more privacy and so forth, but, you know, we're, we're, I think that's the danger of, of the approach um, I've taken in your book. Uh, you know, your book, uh, says many good things about American business, and I think there's uh, many ways we can um, uh, say that American you know, business as an enterprise has been uh, successful over the last century and so forth. But one of the reasons I think, uh, and I think this is really key, that I think the American economy uh, has been successful is because we are critical of it. Uh, because we have an antitrust law, at least when we're enforcing it, that has forced uh, Amer American companies to face their competitors. Because we have broken up uh, monopolists like AT&T and rebooted sectors. So in other words, this critical attitude, which I referred to in the beginning, which I think is really an important part of the American uh, tradition, a suspicion of power, uh, is absent, I think, from your book. And that's why I think it's a dangerous path. Now, does this connect to the tech? In obvious ways. But I think the attitude is very important. I think that if we're in danger, of, every country, I think, is in some danger of, of becoming enthralled and in sort of worship of power, uh, political power, economic power, whatever it is. But I think it's an important, and, and this is part of why I wrote the book, because I think antitrust enforcers need to be in this, uh, in, in this mindset as well. One of the goals of my book was put some, you know, antitrust enforcers are good people. They, they, 
They, they're intelligent, but they don't at this point have steel in their backbones the way the antitrust enforcer did in the 50s, the way Thurman Arnold did, the way Theodore Roosevelt did when he took on the, the most terrifying countries, uh, companies of his time. And we need to restore some of that attitude. And the reason I disagree with the approach taken in your book is it is just too accepting of that which is, is that which should be. Tyler, I'd love to have you react to that because it seems to me to raise an interesting question. Do, does business thrive better in an atmosphere of skepticism? Should we have a love letter? Let me start with a bit more on the monopoly issue. If you look at Facebook or Google, they enable small and mid-sized businesses to advertise like never before. Businesses which could not afford TV or radio advertising now have a place to go to target ads in an economical way. So those two companies are two of the most significant anti-monopoly institutions in the whole American economy. In my book, I absolutely say we do not live in the best of all possible worlds. But when you ask the comparative question, how well will a group of regulators, and we saw Mark Zuckerberg testifying before the Senate, there are people who didn't know Facebook had an ad-supported model. How good a job will a group of regulators do in steering a highly dynamic tech sector, perhaps the most rapid change, the most rapid productivity gains of any sector in any economy in the history of the world? That is conceivably the case. How are we going to steer that? It makes sense that we have public water utilities. Water is a pretty fixed static thing. We know it should be clean. We know how it should taste. I'm asking in my book comparative questions and Tim, you're hearing about everything but the tech sector. There's political dictatorship, there's AT&T, there's Voltaire, there's the 1950s, there's Thurman Arnold. But let's focus on the specifics that might be wrong today and what we should do to fix them. And if we do that, I think the overall picture is going to look pretty positive. Okay, I'd be happy to focus on specifics if you want to. So uh, this overall topic of this uh, debate is, uh, is bigness of curse. So I don't think we're restricted to the tech industry, I, I think, in this discussion. And I think we have a serious problem in the American economy that, that runs like this. So I'm not going to stand here and say there's no economies of scale, because of course there are. But I do believe, uh, this is, here's a difference between maybe a Brandisian and a neo-Brandisian view. It's a difference between bigness and excessive bigness. And I think there comes a point in an industry or in a company's life uh, where it begins to, to realize that it has enough barriers to entry or enough size or enough resources that it uh, no longer needs to make the product any better to keep its customers, uh, and that uh, instead of investing in innovation or better product quality, it's, it's better off investing in barriers to entry and investing in new strategies to extract more con from consumers to sort of figure out ways to use its uh, monopoly power or its market power better or collective oligopoly power. Uh, so what are some of the industries that look like this? Uh, one of the airlines, which uh, one of the industries which you, uh, I think, question, uh, defend uh, in your book in a, in a way I find surprising is the airline industry, which we've allowed to, to uh, consolidate to three or four firms. Um, flying, uh, it's kind of an extraordinary industry because it is in some ways a high-tech industry. Airlines very high-tech. Um, the experience, however, unlike most of the tech products we know about, has gotten worse other than maybe the screens, which I think are a mixed feeling. But it actually is the only tech industry I can think of where the product has both gotten worse and, and more expensive, measured through full prices and also quality decreases, uh, over the last 40 years. So it's an example of what happens when an industry goes wrong. And all the investments in airlines uh, these days are trying to figure out more ways to cram more seats, fill the, the planes ever slightly more, more fully uh, to, to maximize profit. But it's done nothing for, for the flying public. Uh, just as an example. Another industry that, that has gone into this direction is clearly the pharmaceutical industry, which realized that uh, you know, by the help of, of the patent system and other regulatory system, that can focus all its energy, you know, focus its energies away from, from innovation, although they'll always talk about the billions of dollars spent, but uh, there's a strong evidence that uh, they're less interested in seriously in investing in innovation, more interested in trying to figure out and invest in ways to prolong their government protection and to uh, find those little spots where they can raise the price of a drug from $400 to $35,000. You know, when in the case of, uh, uh, for example, um, um, uh, I forgot the disease, but it was an infant seizure uh, disease. So, you know, this is what happens when industries go wrong. These are the failures of American antitrust and regulatory policy. And I think these are very specific examples. I don't think these are abstract. 
you want to talk about tech, which uh, uh, is, is obviously on people's minds, I think the problem in tech that we've had most clearly is with the uh, problem of serial acquisition campaigns, acquisition after acquisition, acquisition, more of what should have been blocked. And uh, the idea that we've had, someone said over 600, you know, I've uh, personally counted between Facebook and Google uh, over 400 acquisitions. I've gone through every one. And the idea that we didn't block a single one suggests that there's a massive under enforcement problem and suggests that what we're giving up on is this, uh, I'll go back to it, something that is the true American tradition, which is that companies should feel the heat of competition. Companies will not improve their products if they don't have to. They just won't. Tyler, you've got a different perspective on acquisitions. You don't see them through such a negative lens, in the tech sphere specifically. Do you want to elaborate on that? Well, take the Facebook acquisition of WhatsApp. WhatsApp is an amazing service. The page is remarkably clean. Facebook upgraded it. Google massively upgraded YouTube. Remember the old days when you would click on videos, they had to buffer, you had to wait. Sometimes you'd download something overnight. Uh, YouTube was considered a cesspool of copyright violations. Uh, Google has put in a lot of work, a lot of money, toward making YouTube much better. So tech acquisitions on the whole have been a positive. There have been a large number of them. I don't think it's possible for anyone to judge how good or bad a particular one necessarily is. But the mere fact that many have happened and not been struck down, it's not evidence that they're bad. Quickly on pharma, to the extent pharma prices are too high, we could end that tomorrow by dropping protectionism. I'm against protectionism. If we need to import drugs from abroad at lower prices, we could do that and get rid of the problems we have. So I would agree there, but I would blame protectionism. Airlines, there's data in my book, the real cost of flying has not gone up. Miles flown by the average American has gone up. People are flying more than ever before. Is TSA a problem? Maybe hard for me to say. Are government managed airports often a problem and NIMBYism? Well, probably that's not the fault of big business. It's simply not true that air travel has just gotten worse. And when you see how many people fly, that's the proof positive. There is something going right about the flying experience. Yes, it's highly imperfect. It's the safest way to travel. More people than ever before want to do it. Quantity is up. Price is volatile, but in real terms, not steadily up over time. So Tyler, one of the things you invoked here and one of the things you seem to invoke a lot in your book is this idea that price is paramount, that it should come back to the, to the price that consumers are paying. Tim, you take this issue on in your book. You think it actually shouldn't be all about price, and the fact that it is is a fault of Chicago, where we sit right now. <laughs> uh, would you like to explain that and why we should be concerned about things other than the price consumers pay? So I think, I, I, you know, in a sense, we're, we're talking about the, the consumer welfare standards. So my view on this is that um, I, I view the consumer welfare standard as a very ambitious experiment, uh, in some ways well-intentioned. I, I think so, there were some people who thought of it as a way just to sort of weaken antitrust, but other people took it very seriously. But I think looking back over the last 20 years, we have to conclude the experiment has not been successful. And the reason is actually that it has not succeeded on its own terms, that there are too many variables that are immeasurable in too many situations. I mean, everyone who is even vaguely honest as an economist, will agree that dynamic costs uh, uh, matter more than static costs, and dynamic benefits matter more than uh, uh, static benefits. But those are the hardest thing to measure. And so we've gone trapped in a world where the old joke about the economist and the, and the street light has become the soul of the law, and which would be hilarious if it wasn't tragic. You know, we, we get in these crazy situations where everybody knows the main variables that we're talking about are not in play at all. Now, that's just sticking with the economics of the situation. I also think we have neglected the politics of the situation. Uh, the, when, the, when the Sherman Act was passed, when the Anti-Merger Act, uh, Act was passed in the 1950s, one of the major concerns was that uh, oversized industries have a disproportionate political influence. This is straight up Manker Olson uh, kind of logic. The less entities in an industry there are, the easier it is for them to cooperate to get the political outcomes they want. Everybody knows this is political choice 101. What we forget is that merger policy, antitrust policy, is setting the degree of industry concentration and therefore determining how much, in a sense, lobbying power we're, we are, are creating. And so, in fact, merger policy is also public choice policy. Merger policy is also determining lobbying. And I don't think it's any surprise, therefore, that you have a result where on so many issues, Americans cannot get, the public cannot get what they want. 
You know, you have an oppression of the supermajority. I'm not even talking about Trump sort of Democrat things. I'm talking about, you know, say 89% of people want better privacy protections. You want, you're part of that uh, supermajority. No one can get those laws passed. Uh, people want, you know, uh, uh, just to take another example, um, uh, peop there's a broad majority would like uh, uh, caps on pharmaceutical pricing or some kind of better method of, of pharmaceutical pricing, some kind of reform of healthcare. None of that stuff can get, can get through. And I think this has a lot to do with what antitrust was originally concerned about, over-concentrated private power. Medicare Part D, anybody? Um, so this whole issue of privacy, which in a way is where the two of you agree, because Tyler, you do think that there's an issue with that there are real privacy concerns. And it seems to be in some ways separate from market power. But I think maybe that it's not. Because to me, the, the question is, if a lack of concern about privacy means more profits for company, companies, especially for the big tech companies, and I guess that's an if, but if that's true, aren't we in a problematic place as the tech companies get bigger and bigger? I would first stress a very basic point. In most people's lives, the main threats to your privacy are people you know, your colleagues, your friends, your acquaintances. It's not actually the big tech companies who are the main wreckers of privacy. The first privacy regulations I would want are some kinds of restrictions on visual surveillance. San Francisco just did a version of this, I think, yesterday. Uh, I haven't read yet what they've done, but I think some version of that is probably a good idea. Uh, so we need to think, what are the main threats to privacy? It's not actually the tech companies for the most part. One reason why we haven't had good privacy legislation when it comes to the tech companies, it's a very hard problem to solve. If you look at GDPR, not only is it a significant barrier to entry, but the law is not yet fully enforced. And when you think through all the components of GDPR, how will they be applied to potential innovations such as the blockchain? How will they be applied to small and mid-sized players massively not in compliance? I would say we don't know yet. We don't know how that law will turn out, but there are so many loose ends, so many unintended consequences. I think we in America would be making a big mistake to just jump into the GDPR pool. It's in essence a decision to move away from the rule of law and pass something which has to be enforced in some highly discretionary fashion. Uh, so I would do more on privacy, but again, the zip file Facebook holds on me is very far from my top list of worries. And I always find it striking, people in the privacy movement, it's become a kind of anti-corporate or anti-tech movement. I would say, think about privacy most generally. The biggest thing you can do to boost your privacy is to move out of a rural area to a city or populated suburb. Americans have done that in great numbers. Overall, on net, our privacy is going up. Yes, it should be better yet. It's not always an easy thing to accomplish. Tim, I think Tyler disagrees with me, but would you see a link, <laughs> would, would you see a link between big tech and privacy concerns? In other words, as tech companies become bigger and bigger and more monop monopolistic, does that increase privacy concerns, given the profits are, that are at stake? Uh, I mean, I don't think we need to look to the future. I think we can look to the past, last 10 years, pretty, pretty straightforwardly, and now I will focus on Facebook. Um, so, you know, sometimes I, um, I, I think I disappoint people who hope I'll be more radical because I feel I'm just extraordinarily mainstream when I say that I believe competition improves the quality of products. And I believe if Facebook faced some serious competitors over the last 10 years, um, for example, Instagram and WhatsApp, if we hadn't uh, 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 let those mergers uh, go forward, that in fact they may have felt more pressure to actually deliver uh, on the promises they had made to their, their users fearing uh, when scandals came out, as they did, as they must have known, that they would have a chance of people actually defecting. It's very interesting to watch what happened uh, when Facebook went through these, uh, these privacy scandals. And when Uber went through its scandals, you notice a lot of people moving. You know, they were like, I'm done with these guys. I'm going to go to Lyft or you know, Juno or some other company. These guys are bad. Facebook, uh, there was nowhere to go. I, I know you say you could go to g Gmail chat. Um, it reminds me a little bit no, of... Oh, I listed um, 10 different places. You <laughs> sorry, 10 out. other places. It reminds me a little... For, this is an insider antitrust joke. It reminds me a little bit of the TurboTax pen and paper argument or the argument that, uh, you know, there's no problem with the AT&T monopoly. We've still got the Telegraph. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I'm uh, trying to spice this debate up a little bit. Um, <laughs> 
so I think that if Facebook had faced competitive pressure over the last 10 years and had, had people going at them, that they would have felt, first of all, more pressure to do so. And then if they you know, continue with their policies, people really would have had somewhere to defect, somewhere to go. And I think, you know, you um, may be an exception, but most people didn't feel that, that the, the 10 alternatives you're talking about were, were viable alternatives. That's, it's almost a, te it's a natural born SNPs test, except to throw some more jargon people in here. don't use email? Except for it's a, de it's a natural born decrease in quality and we don't see people leave. SNPs test, you raise the price, nobody leaves. Facebook airlines, they decrease the quality, nobody leaves. And when you see that, I think you know you got a problem. When people are un unable to go somewhere, when their product quality decreases, that to me is showing of a, of a market power buried entry problem. Tyler? WhatsApp is about the most private system we have. There is possibly one story from this week about a possible hack. But everything that we know which can be done to make a system private is done in WhatsApp encryption at the highest level we have possible. And that has been upgraded. And we have kept the page clean through Facebook. So you're saying Facebook has done nothing for privacy. And Facebook has upgraded the very most private system we have in the whole world. It doesn't make sense. And the alternatives to social networking, to Facebook, they're not obscure, weird things like you know, sending someone a telegram. Uh, they're profitable businesses used by many millions or billions of people. Most people want to belong Most in China. to multiple <laughs> social networks. And what uh -huh. they use for what purpose varies. And there's plenty of competition. And what I do find distressing, when you look at people's actual behavior, not what they say in polls, it's not clear how much Americans value online privacy. Some of us might disagree with that, but it's going to be very hard to get privacy regulation or even privacy competition to work when that is the case. When you cite options, though, aren't you underestimating the network effect? I mean, that's what's at the heart of the fear of big tech, right, is that the big becomes bigger because of the network effect. And so even though there may be other options, those options are always going to be marginal. Do you worry that you're understating that, 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 that unique factor, of, or not unique factor, but that factor of big tech? I don't think sending my friend a text as a way of networking is a marginal option. People do that in extraordinary numbers. I don't think sending people email or encrypted WhatsApp messages, even though the latter one is done through Facebook the company, those are not marginal options. So we have so many ways of connecting with each other. My goodness, even the telephone, they still exist. I don't answer mine. But it's there. It's, <laughs> it's not that terrible. It's not like a 19th century telegraph. Uh, if you tell someone something over the telephone, I'm not saying there's ever perfect privacy, but that is private in a way that what you might do on Facebook is not. So there's plenty of competition, plenty of live options used by billions of people. So I wanted to back up a little bit because you had invoked um, both Rockefeller and Roosevelt earlier as you did in your book. And you quote Rockefeller in your book as saying this, growth of a large business is merely a survival of the fittest, the working out of a law of nature and of a law of God. And Tyler, you wrote something remarkably similar, which is that <laughs> arguably the biggest problem with American business is the politically in incorrect truth that too often it simply isn't big enough and successful enough. It isn't ambitious enough or doing a good enough job of boosting profits and growing toward gargantuan size. So I thought I'd ask you would you have kept Standard Oil together? You know, before I came to the session, I thought, they're going to ask about Standard Oil. <laughs> I should go back no, and look that at unexpected. that case. <laughs> and I read several documents about the case, and I came to the conclusion of I don't know whether or not we did the right thing. Uh, there is a revisionist dissenting view by Dominic Armentano, who argues prices were falling at the time. I'm not sure he has the correct counterfactual. I would say, I don't know. But I just get a bit nervous when people invoke historical points from the past as if it's all obvious that we should agree about a particular case. Uh, Tim has argued that market concentration helped drive the rise of fascism. It turns out historians of Nazi Germany do not in general agree with that claim. It seems to be false. Be very careful about how history is used. On standard oil, I would say I have not seen a good final resolution of that question. I'm sure Tim will tell you otherwise. Yeah, so I'm learning that Facebook's not a threat to privacy, that Standard Oil is not, was not a rapacious monopoly. I feel like I'm sort of arguing with a flat That's earth society. That's not what I said. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, you said you're not sure whether or not Standard Oil was, uh, was a, 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 should have been. What, what are you saying then I'm about Standard sure Oil? I'm not sure we did exactly the right thing with Standard Oil. I right. have read some of the literature, not a specialist in that case, and arrived at an agnostic conclusion. And you're being sarcastic. Uh, I am because <laughs> it's a debate and we're trying to entertain people. But I, you know, I can, I, you're a nice guy, which makes me feel a little 
a little, little guilty about it, but you know. Good. Um, <laughs> um, Standard Oil, uh, so Standard Oil, I, I, um, one of the uh, interesting things about Standard Oil is uh, after they were broken up, uh, it's sort of, I think, a pretty strong proof of the inefficiency of the form, uh, the oil industry prospered in, 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 a, in, a, in a more competitive and a more broken up form. You know, you can say what you want about the oil industry and some of the things it did uh, for the environment, but um, I think the track record of competition is superior to, to monopoly, and I think the Standard Oil case is one of the examples. I think if you look at the, the history of American tech industries, I think uh, some of the most successful antitrust cases in American history were against the, the, the trilogy against AT&T, Microsoft, and slightly more controversial IBM. Uh, each of those cases, uh, you know, we, we basically turned on what seemed like, I, I think it's a similar situation today, you know, darling companies, uh, very, very advanced, um, uh, our national champions who are going to do battle with the great rising Asian power, Japan, uh, which obviously was, was much smarter than Americans because their government was supporting their tech monopolies, not trying to, to take them on. And, uh, you know, what do we do instead? We tried to break up IBM, chase them around for 13 years, did break up AT&T and chased around Microsoft, almost broke up Microsoft if, uh, if Florida hadn't gone the wrong way. So, uh, and some of the people in this room, or the wrong way in my view, I'm a, I'm a Democrat, but um, the, uh, the, uh, I think the lesson from those is that Japan actually took the wrong approach, and I think some of the people, uh, and I'm going to accuse you of this because it's a debate, I think that, uh, you know, you're uh, taking a policy which uh, frankly reminds me of, of the policy Japan took towards tech in the 70s and 80s, which is, these guys are great companies, why would we ever consider breaking them up? Uh, you know, AT&T's invented a million different things, and they're really nice guys, and, and IBM, you know, they're, 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 mod, they're, they're true. We gotta look, or, or maybe we, just, we gotta think about this more carefully. We don't really know, it's ambiguous, so let's not do anything. Um, you know, after chasing around IBM, they, they spit out the software industry. Uh, they, uh, even in, you know, the recent uh, research on this has made it clear that IBM, indirect consequence of being sued, um, or knowing they were gonna be sued, said, okay, that's it, we gotta unbundle software. You know, they're just going to have us in pieces. And so you start this thing called the software industry. The software industry is worth how many trillions of dollars right now? Now, it could have happened eventually. Everything happens eventually, but I think that had a, a big factor. Uh, the PC industry gets started during the IBM. So why does IBM not buy uh, Microsoft when they obviously could have? Not buy Intel. The internal documentation says they were afraid of getting antitrust started again. They had the policeman at the elbow for, for, for 15 years in a crucial period of tech development. And that's why I think we need to be tuck on, tough on big tech right now and not uh, coddle them and not celebrate them uh, too much, is we need to realize there will be whatever the next industry is that is going to need some room to get started. And if we take the Japanese approach or, uh, and we say, oh, listen, NT&T is the greatest thing ever, NEC, supercomputers are the future, um, uh, we're not going to leave enough room, and I think we're going to lose what has been an extraordinary American tradition of criticizing our biggest companies in order to make us better. So in fairness to Tyler, um, um, you, Tim, you do write in your book that monopolies in the old days tended to involve deception, bribery, and even the killing of workers to quell unrest, and, quell unrest, and I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, maybe that's coming. But I thought in reading both of your, <laughs> I, thought, I thought in reading both of your works that, that one of the key areas that, that of, of intellectual disagreement actually is over Microsoft, and since you invoked it, I wanted to turn to that. You seem to, Tyler, have the perspective that Microsoft would have faded from the forefront of the tech industry anyway just naturally, because as you point out, we don't know yet what's coming with Google, with artificial intelligence, and that Microsoft's fading was sort of part of natural evolution. Whereas, Tim, I think you feel that it was a result right. of government inter intervention. So maybe you could both could address that for a little bit. Tyler? Well, Microsoft today is a huge company, some days ranked number one in terms of capitalization. So when we say fade, let's keep that in perspective. But the early Microsoft did not get some aspects of the internet had there not been an antitrust suit against that Microsoft, I think we would have had roughly the same kinds of innovation we have had. On the IBM case, if you read Frank Fisher's very extensive book on that case, it's very hard to come away from that book thinking the case was a good idea. Antitrust is a long time consuming, highly uncertain set of remedies. A case can stretch on for decades, and at the end you lose it. 
top management are distracted, companies become more legalistic, they lose their dynamic culture. Why would we want to take some of America's best companies, which I might add are around the world competing with Chinese and other tech companies? This is not only a commercial issue, but it's a freedom issue. Whose tech companies will be serving the rest of the world? And throw them this boomerang when so many of the products are free or super low price, people find the quality for the most part phenomenally high. And just the, the general opinion that one knows the correct answer to an antitrust suit before all the evidence is heard. It's as if I came along and said, hey, that guy on the street, prosecute him for robbery. There's something I don't like about his situation. We live under a rule of law. Should we go down this path when consumer harm is not clear, the antitrust process is highly imperfect, there is a global struggle in the tech world as to whether it will be American companies serving the world or possibly Chinese or other. To me, the balance of evidence is that right now we should be supporting our tech companies rather than going after them. Tim, what do you make of those two arguments that the world would be the same regardless of whether Microsoft had been prosecuted, had been had been investigated and, and, and char charged with antitrust or not, and that that taking on tech means destroying America? I didn't yeah, say, that. <laughs> didn't say that. I'm exaggerating. <laughs> the moderator's prerogative. <laughs> uh, let me quote from another movie, Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, uh, <laughs> nothing is written. Um, I, I don't believe in this kind of. Um, predetermined destiny of, of tech. Having read too much of the history of, of technological industries, I, I don't think, I think in fact that new technologies do get, don't naturally emerge, that, that uh, companies can be stagnant for, for decades, um, that uh, ideas that might have come to the forefront earlier become submerged, uh, and that not everything, uh, and we, I guess to repeat my thesis, we don't live in the, the best of all possible worlds. So in the case of Microsoft, I think we're very, very precise about Microsoft. Um, and I've done a lot of, 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 of research in this and actually, and discussions with people inside Microsoft. So in, in the 1990s through 1980s, Microsoft had a very sort of straightforward uh, business model, which was they would uh, own the platform, uh, open the platform ostensibly, and um, figure out which were the most successful of the applications uh, that, that prospered, uh, clone them, and then sort of tilt the playing field so that their, uh, their applications would win. And so they'd done that on DOS. They had uh, had some success with that strategy uh, on, on Windows. Uh, WordPerfect, Lotus 123 were some of the victims uh, of that. And we're in the course of executing the same strategy with Netscape uh, with the idea, frankly, of conquering the next platform. This is what anchored the Justice Department's case, that Microsoft wanted to own the next platform, which they, they correctly saw. If you go back, you know, Bill Gates, uh, you can say whatever uh, you want about the guy, but he had an incredible vision, I think, of the future and an incredible sense of where the choke points were. And he saw, you know, before other people did, that the browser was, was the key point of control. Uh, and so he determined he was going to own the browser market and, and uh, destroy Netscape along the way. And so that was the business plan. And so let's imagine, kind of counter, you know, no one knows what would happen. Let's say they succeeded. They did succeed in... in in monopolizing browsers. By 01 or so, Microsoft, had, I think, had about a 92% market share with Explorer. So there they go. Now, now they watch what shows up on the browser. Uh, the search engine shows up. The social network shows up. Maybe a shopping. So suddenly, there's Microsoft versions of all those things. In fact, there was a Microsoft search engine. And now, how does Google win in competition against, uh, I don't know if it would have been called Bing. Let's call it Bing, when Microsoft uh, controls the platform, and when Microsoft can, can make Bing the default search engine, uh, can, can make Google not function well, maybe a cage is sort of like, like Netscape has a second or two delay, is never pre-shipped, et cetera, just use the same playbook. I think we would have lost a generation of innovation, a generation of companies. Uh, in fact, the same companies we're criticizing right now, that's why I believe in cycles. You know, that all these, uh, these, these ha I mean, at a minimum, it was a subsidy or a boost to these industries and therefore successful industrial policy. So I think the Microsoft case is pretty crucial and that's the tradition I'm talking about. That trilogy, Microsoft, IBM, and, and, and AT&T, I think represent the best of American industrial policy, which I, to repeat my point, is I don't think we believe in, in uh, national champions. I don't think we believe 
that the right answer is to say, these are the companies that have got it, we got to make sure they win overseas. And uh, that's a mercantilist attitude that I don't believe in. And I think we do best when we challenge our own companies and we leave what, what all those, company, what, what all those um, cases did. None of them burnt the other company to the ground. Microsoft's still around, as you said. They just created room for entrants to get their start. They just left enough space for these guys to get going. And if they had a better product, win. And in the end, Google, I'm, now I'm going to be praising these guys. Google had a better search engine. Than, than Microsoft had. That's why they won in the early stages. Now the question is whether they're winning fair or not, and that's why we need to keep scrutinizing. There's nothing in your story that suggests we should split up the big tech companies today. We didn't disassemble Microsoft back then, right? You might favor some kind of provision for equal access, but you're telling a story of one thing we did and concluding we need to split up big tech today. That just doesn't at all follow. Uh, three things we did, but yeah, uh-huh. I wanted actually to open it up to questions because Tim has to run in the next um, 10 minutes. So if there are questions, um, we, should, we should get to them now. So, but, but I did also want to note while we wait for a microphone to get over there that the EU argued that Google used its dominance of the Android market to force manufacturers not to make Android phones using non-Google operating systems, right? I think that fine is still being appealed, but it's an interesting parallel. So mm -hmm. go ahead. So, um, I think I'm completely right uh, within the rule of law. That's why when Microsoft engaged in a, in a long series of conduct that had no efficiency enhancing properties and the effect of which was to raise entry barriers by uh, protecting its monopoly, it clearly violated the law, it was an easy case. Um, but it's in that spirit I want to ask Tim a question. Sure. So Tim, the antitrust laws are about protecting competition in the same way you talk about it, that is to say by restricting the circumstances under which firms are entitled to gain or maintain uh, market power, market power being of freedom from the discipline of, of, of competition. Uh, that's a kind of a technocratic thing, and, and, and you and I can discuss and, and probably agree largely but not entirely on, on adjustments at the margin that might be made to improve that enterprise. But I think you go beyond that when you reference Brandeis and our tradition mm -hmm. and, all, and all other values. You seem to be saying that, that, that decision makers and enforcers should also take into account uh, protecting the little guy and, and distribution of political power and other, other uh, 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 objectives that can't be measured in terms of market competition. And, and my question is this, um, how do you have a regime that takes those values into account in addition to the market power uh, interest uh, without having decisions necessarily be arbitrary because of the lack of a, of, a, of a precise and enforceable algorithm to determine how you weight these different objectives when they conflict. And right. if you have arbitrary decisions, aren't you opening up the process uh, to a kind of capture, uh, by, uh, which will ultimately redound to the benefit of the powerful, not the powerless? It's a good question. Let, let the record reflect that uh, the debate between the neo taftian school and the Neo-Brandisian school has suddenly been undertaken. I think it's, this is a great conference for that reason. You know, we're really getting at the, the core of, of what these, these questions are. It's like the 1912 election all over again. Um, maybe, I'm, maybe we could have, like, have a reenactment and wear like, outfits next time. So um, I think, okay, so I think uh, contrary to, to what you're suggesting, no, law enforcement is never algorithmic. It's always judgment. I mean, you're a law enforcer, or we're a law enforcer. Many of the people in this room know that uh, law enforcement always is a matter of judgment, you know, based on data, based on things, but is never uh, turned into a, a binary question. And I think that law enforcement should take uh, the problem of, uh, of, of excessive private political power into consideration. That's the Brandisian side of me. Let me talk about the AT&T breakup, um, Mr. Respect. Uh, one of the problems you had with AT&T at the height of their power was their political power. They had uh, almost, uh, until the 70s, complete uh, uh, control of, of the FCC. Nixon kind of uh, turned that around. And there was never, um, they had a formidable presence in, in any kind of lobbying situation. One of the important consequences of breaking up AT&T vertically, as well as horizontally, is suddenly had a distribution of powers in you suddenly had uh, some kind of equality of arms when it came to the politics of telecom. And that's why you had this period of telecom deregulation, all these different competitive policies, entry policies through the 1980s, 1990s, a lot of which led to, to what we now call the internet boom, the telecom boom, and in, you know, creation of trillions of dollars in value. Now, I'm going to not credit it all to the AT&T breakup, but I think that at the back of their heads, the enforcer should have thought, and I think they did, we have on the record, they did think, one of the problems with AT&T is political. 
they become like a branch of government. The market cannot, cannot uh, the agencies are powerless before them. They're disobeying the FCC. Uh, you know, at some point, this is a constitutional matter that we, gotta, we, we need to act. And that's the kind of instinct I think law enforcement needs to have. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry, healthcare industry, these may be industries where you say, listen, these guys are just way, just their, their political power, in addition to their economic sins and their breaking of the law, gives further reason why we need to act in this area. And this is why I say antitrust has a constitutional uh, dimension. Uh, I had a question for Tyler. You, you looked at the evidence about whether big business is, is good or bad and whether it's contributing to, to um, the welfare of society. Um, you missed out one bit, and I'd love to get your view on it, which is uh, abnormally high profits. So were, um, if you look at the US economy, uh, profits are abnormally high relative to GDP. Cap uh, returns on capital are very high and very skewed. Uh, profitability seems to be more persistent, so companies can make a lot of uh, money for longer. Uh, and stock market valuations of these companies seem to imply that they can make enormous amounts of money for a very long time. Um, and that obviously has sort of two is important for two reasons. One, because it might be evidence of a lack of competition. They seem to be able to extract large rents. Um, uh, you know, which, which may be a sign that the, the, the capitalist process is not working. And secondly, it has a distributional impact because it potentially makes inequality worse. So in your assessment of, of the performance of, of US uh, big business, what do you make of, of the, the profit boom? I think some of the profit boom is globalization. So the bigger the world economy, the sharper a distinction there will be between firms which export and firms which do not. And a pretty high portion of earnings of the S&P 500 comes from global markets. Another part of it is intangible capital, which I feel we do not understand very well. But we see more and more intangible capital in businesses relative to physical capital. We should not assume that is a sign of monopoly power. It may be in some particular cases. Uh, data on accounting profits are not very reliable. Uh, the stock market is in good shape. What, I, what seems to me the clearest regularity, there's a sharper distinction between what are sometimes called super firms in terms of both productivity and wages and firms which are not super firms. I think the implied policy prescription there is what can we do to grow more super firms, uh, not an anti-business policy prescription. So that's just. Can, can a rough I, first cut at some of your questions. Can I jump in on this? Uh, I um, think that this is a very important problem. I, I don't, and let's talk about distribution of wealth and income inequality. I, I don't think that antitrust necessarily is the tool that can fix uh, income redistribution or inequality in our times, but uh, I will say that under enforcement of the laws is not helping, and allowing uh, concentration of abnormal, enormous profits is not helping. Uh, the situation, and I think it's making the world, I want to be you know, more dramatic, making the world a more dangerous place. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the ec economic issues become political. I guess I'm, I'm repeating myself. And, uh, you know, a an economy which structurally seems to be rigged against medium and small business, uh, against workers, eventually leads, makes people angry. And, uh, you know, if you look at a country, uh, look at Brazil, for example. Uh, you know, Brazil had a, a policy over the last, from, you know, last 15 years or so of massively subsidizing these global acquisition campaigns and like JDS Agriculture and, allow, you know, and allowing their, their richest companies to consult and become extremely wealthy. You know, Brazilians got, when everything started to crash and they overbuilt, it's kind of like the American trust movement, people got angry and who did they start voting for? You know, essentially leaders who, who dress in military uniforms and, and promise a return to greatness and uh, uh, stamping down on, on, on dangerous elements in society. So I think there is a link between excessive economic concentration historically and um, the de deprivation of the middle class and a rise of very dangerous solutions, authoritarianism, and even uh, fascist solutions. You're always leaping to other comparisons. Would you agree with the recent paper by Esteban Rossi-Hansberg 
that if you look at it market by market, there is no general increase in concentration in this country. Not how many national brands are there, but how many sellers are there in individual markets. I brought the paper here. I figured this would come up too. It seems pretty convincing. Do you agree? Uh, well, I haven't read that paper, well, uh, but I will read, you know. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll turn to maybe members of our audience. Jason Furman's here. A lot of other people here, I think, might dissent from the view of one paper that there's been no increase in the U.S. Econ uh, concentration in the U.S. economy. In some sectors. And you can wave a paper I haven't read around before and say, well, we've proved it now. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that's a subject of some pretty uh, tight uh, debate. And, uh, you know, the vast majority, this is a little, actually, this is starting to sound like climate change. I brought up flat worth, you know. So there's one paper, I and mean, maybe there's like a well, hundred other papers that say that <laughs> it's climate change, it's Voltaire, the best of all possible words. It's, it's a, it's a debate. To the fact. I'm not saying this paper proves it. It's the latest word. It's open to reinterpretation. It's open to debate. But you hear too quickly on the basis of simply counting brands at the national level that concentration is up. A more disaggregated perspective typically typically gives you more optimistic results. It doesn't mean there's no monopoly problem. There's a big monopoly problem with hospitals. I would say K through 12 education. Yes, there are some monopoly problems in our economy. But stick to the actual facts on particular issues. Don't compare it to Japan and fascist totalitarianism and standard oil and everything else. OK, well, if you want me to <laughs> stick with concentration, I mean, uh, you know, I'm at a disadvantage not being an economist. But I don't think the people who are trying to measure the increase of uh, concentration in the economy are just counting up brands. I think they're looking at the HHI in, 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 in markets or looking at industry data, doing the best they can. And as far as I've read it, the weight of the evidence suggests that the United States economy has grown more concentrated. And I think that has something to do with antitrust policy and merger enforcement. And you know, it, well, as we talked about tech. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious that uh, tech. So I don't, I don't want to wade into an economic uh, debate as to whether concentration is going on. But I don't want you to wave one paper in my face and say that's, uh, that's settled it. We also, we I didn't say that settled it. I, I say, said sorry, it that, didn't that, that, settle it. This is the latest word, is what you said. <laughs> we actually have to wrap up because you have to oh, get yes, to the airport. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, but, I, but, but I think we did end can this Can I say up. something yes, in the end? We course. should both say you something in the end. You don't have to go to the airport. You can I missed my flight. Okay. No, you, I, why, why don't we, why don't we uh, end uh, with uh, amicable comments? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say I have enjoyed reading Tim's book and all of his books. And I hope you all enjoy mine. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, a marketing op. I, 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 uh, you know, Tyler is a nice guy, and his book is actually uh, uh, quite, quite reasonable. But I, I really think it's important. Uh, we have an American tradition that it is, you know, actually periodically is in danger, where we're always in danger of starting to start to believe a little bit more in centralized planning, forget about, uh, I think, the importance of competition and market entry, uh, you know, start to fall in some quiet worship of power in the monopoly form. And you know it's happened before. That's why I think we need to reboot, whether it's Taftian or Brandisian. That's why I think we're here. And uh, at bottom, I think we do a service by questioning, by going back to what has worked best. And that has been an attitude of criticism, an attitude of demanding that companies face competition. And that is uh, our creed. So thank you very much. Thank you both very much for being here. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Now you have to run. Take care. Good luck getting home.